Hello, I'm Mokar Rizvi, and this is Sculp. In the first segment of today's show, we're going to discuss the International Criminal Court's decision to begin a formal investigation into possible war crimes that have taken place in the occupied Palestinian territories. Um, so it's looking both at Israeli activities as well as also Palestinian activities um, in the occupied territories. Now, Israel, as well as the United States, have rejected the jurisdiction of the court altogether, considering neither of the two, in fact, are are um, members of the Rome Statute. I'm speaking about Israel and America. However, Palestine is a member and has signed on to the Rome Statute itself. Um, Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister, has gone as far as calling this entire investigation anti-Semitic uh, altogether. Um, of course, he falls back on that sort of accusation quite a bit when it comes to any um, sort of accountability, if I may use that term, when it comes to Israeli activities in the occupied territories. Um, the Israeli establishment is also currently working to protect hundreds of its own citizens who are potentially then going to be up uh, in the dock um, for war crimes accusations if this investigation does go through as it is currently planned to do so. Let's discuss all of that a bit further. And I'm joined by Yossi Mecklenburg, who is a senior consulting research fellow at Chatham House. He's joining us today from London. Joining us today from Tel Aviv is Gideon Levy, who is an award-winning Israeli journalist and weekly Haaretz columnist and author as well. And we're also going to be joined later on from Liverpool by Dr. Trist. Triestino Mariniello, who is a senior lecturer in law at Liverpool John Moores University. Uh, Gideon, Yossi, and Triestino, thank you both. Thank you to all three of you, I should say, pardon me, for taking your time out on this Friday to join us here in Scope. Um, Gideon, let me start with you. Um, how important is this investigation at this time? Uh, do you think the Israelis are genuinely worried about this? First of all, yes, they are genuinely worried. But it's a long way to go. I mean, if someone thinks that within days or weeks, Israelis, officers and politicians will be arrested, the way is still long to go. But at least something is shaking. And, and that's, that's the significance of this decision, that Israelis, Israeli generals and politicians will have to think twice before the, committing the next war of, uh, crime of war, and meanwhile, they try to find their way out of, of responsibility, accountability. Look, there is, I can't think about another case in which the involvement of the International Criminal Court is so vital like in this case. When an occupation of 53 years is going on, Crimes are committed on a daily basis, crimes of the international law, and above all, Israel is not bringing those who commit the crimes to justice, then that's exactly the place where the international uh, uh, criminal court must get involved, and therefore it's a source of hope for people like me. Trias, you know, I, I wonder what your thoughts are on, on this case now becoming a formal investigation, right? I mean, Israel, uh, the Israelis and the Americans did everything they can to try to ensure that this day would not come, right? That, that even a formal investigation would not begin. Um, do you think that there will be, of course, I imagine there will be a lot of obstacles in the path of this investigation, but how far will it really be able to go to find the truth? Well, uh, uh, I mean, first of all, this is uh, an historic decision. It's an historic decision for uh, the victims of the most serious crimes which have been committed by Israeli authorities and uh, Israeli member of forces uh, um, in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and in the Gaza Strip. Uh, there are, as you correctly said, there are a lot of pressures on the court, not only by Israel and by the US, but also by state parties. Uh, including uh, Germany, for instance, uh, and uh, other states. Uh, but now justice uh, is open. Um, the prosecutor just a few days ago has formally announced the um, opening of the investigation, and now it's just time to bring cases to the court, to the court as soon as possible. In other words, to identify uh, alleged perpetrators of war crimes and hopefully of crimes against humanity committed in the Israeli-Palestinian uh, situation. 
situation. Of course, this will take years, uh, will take time like uh, all the other proceedings before the International Criminal Court. The court deals with uh, massive crimes. So uh, investigation are lengthy uh, as well. But uh, uh, now it will be very difficult for uh, all the actors, state and state actors, uh, who don't want uh, justice in the specific situation to uh, stop, to prevent the court, the prosecutor, from uh, investigating these crimes and bringing justice to the victims. Yossi, how does one come to justice, right? Because there's this, um, I mean, it's not as confusing as, as I originally thought, right? I mean, Palestine is, is a signatory to the Rome, Rome Statute, pardon me, Israel is not. However, of course, these are, um, this, is, this, is, this is a dispute over exactly who even rules over these territories at this point in time, according to international law. Um, so why would the Israelis continue to argue a question of jurisdiction? I mean, certainly they would understand that in international communities eyes, this is still very much disputed territory? Well, first and foremost, this is diversion and delaying tactics. And as, as Gideon said at the beginning, this is not going, something that's going to take place in a matter of days and months. We are talking about a process. And at, at this stage, I think almost the symbolism is important than anything else what's happening uh, next. That's, that's the reason that the ICC was established, to deal with war crimes, to deal with crimes against humanity, to ensure that there is justice for, for, for victims. Now, <clears throat> arguments will run in different direction, trying to discredit the courts. Uh, you mentioned in your opening remarks, Netanyahu already called it an anti-Semitic act, or one can actually see the connection the call between antisemitism and investigation by the way not only not only israel but only also the hamas action in 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 the occupied territories mm -hmm. so those are the we will continue to see this kind of delaying postponing the diversion but the important thing is that the icc is trying to do its job and its job is to investigate uh, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and then bring the perpetrators to justice. That's why it's there. Gideon, the, the argument on the part of the Israelis, as well as the Americans, you know, in their respective case in front of the ICC when it comes to Afghanistan, is that we can police ourselves. We will investigate ourselves, that our process is very, very robust, and we're very strict on our respective um, serving members, soldiers, et cetera. Um, you know, sitting in, in your vantage point, is that the case? I mean, or does the international community need to get involved to ensure accountability? I smile when you phrased your question, and it was a very, very bitter smile, because that's obviously a joke, a very sad joke, if I may say so. I'm uh, covering the Israeli occupation now over 30, 35 years, and I can tell you that almost nobody was brought to justice. And, uh, you know, there were some big operations with hundreds of uh, children killed and women killed, and finally they brought to call to one soldier who stole a credit card in Gaza. Yeah, that's the maximum they can get. It's a whole system of covering up the crimes to call the military a legal system. A legal system is like calling a military orchestra, uh, really an orchestra. It's a joke. It's, it's, it's ridiculous even to raise this, this argument. Israel covered up all the crimes of war that it had been committing in the last 53 years. From the settlements to shooting over 200 unarmed demonstrators by the border in Gaza, from the operations in Gaza to daily crimes of demolishing houses, expelling people from their lands, and, and, uh, and, and the the occupation by itself, which is by itself, by definition, a crime of war. Yeah, so Tracy, you know, I'm looking then right now, as, as I put it to Gideon, when it comes to how exactly um, 
you know, international law, et cetera. I mean, there's, there's so many aspects of this that can be discussed, but just the international law aspect, if I may bring it up with you as well. What is your view on that? Because uh, one would think that the Israelis will do their max, right, to, to play up the fact that they have not signed onto the Rome Statute. Um, what does that then mean for accountability at all? I mean, is this a hopeless case? Well, no, no, not at all. I mean, uh, uh, the fact that Israel is not a state party to the Rem Statute is uh, completely irrelevant in this situation because the court has a jurisdiction over crimes committed on the territory of a state party. And this decision uh, coming from the Petrayal Chamber of the ICC is very important in this regard because clearly recognized that Palestine, after 12 years since these proceedings started, when in two when Palestine, the state of Palestine started its formal engagement with the International Criminal Court, after 12 years, the cham a chamber, judges, have clearly recognized that Palestine is a state party, something that we know very clearly since Palestine joined the state of the International Criminal Court. And the court can exercise its jurisdiction over crimes committed on its territory. And the fact that Israel has not ratified uh, the statute is completely relevant. Palestine has this jurisdiction and can transfer the jurisdiction to the international international criminal court. So, I mean, um, most likely Israel will not cooperate with the court. That's clear, but that uh, could be um, a problem for the investigation, but will not prevent the court and the office of the prosecutor to conduct the uh, investigation and to collect evidence. And we don't need, we don't have to forget that we are talking of a situation which is maybe uh, the most documented situation for serious violation of human rights amounting to international crimes, war crimes and crimes against humanity in in the world. If we look, for instance, at the crime at settlements as a war crime, I mean, the Office of the Prosecutor has already all the evidence, which is public, of this uh, ongoing crime and could open a case and close it in a very uh, short time, independently uh, from the cooperation of uh, Israeli authorities. Uh, Yossi, one of the one of the huge obstacles here for the ICC, right, is the sanctions that were put in place by Donald Trump, right, on Fatou Ben Souda, as well as uh, I believe other ICC uh, members as well. Uh, Biden had come into office, you know, saying that I think he would review those sanctions. Uh, Netanyahu obviously wants those to remain. Uh, which way do you think Biden will lean when it comes to that issue? Because then there is that whole context of also the fact that even the Americans would be in the dock then over Afghanistan. Well, I don't think that uh, President Biden is going to act very differently, forgive me, than, than uh, President Trump. But I think what you point out to is it's, it's a very important flaw in the international system. That the law applies to you only if you sign to it. Unlike when you are a, a citizen of, of a state, the law applies to you whether you like it or not. You're a citizen of a state. If you even, not a citizen, if you live in a state, the law applies to you. When it comes to the international system, there is a basic flaw. It's the same goes for the, the NPT agreement. If you are not a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, you do not in violation of it if you do, do, this is changing, uh, if you develop nuclear capability or nuclear weapons. The same goes to the ICC. I don't sign it, so it means it doesn't apply to me. This is something that, that needs to change and need to be addressed in this context, not to allow countries that commit war crimes just because they don't sign that they are not that they are not going to be uh, accountable to, uh, to war crimes and uh, and in this sense uh, the united states will continue to support uh, to support this and the evidence as, as both other speakers say it's 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 out there uh, Gidon, as he said documented it for so many years and i'm every reader of what Gidon writes and, and it's documented week in, week out in, 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 in newspaper as by other organization. It's a bit really the role of the international system in dealing, not by the way, not only in Israel, not only the case of Israel-Palestine, of ensuring that, uh, that, that there are universal standards of behavior also in a state of war. And this is the, the big question here.
Andy, we'll have to leave there as a final comment, but we sincerely appreciate all three of our guests, Yossi, Gideon, and Triestino, for taking their time out of their schedules to, to share their expertise with us. Yossi speaking to us here from London, Gideon speaking to us from Tel Aviv, and Triestino was speaking to us from Liverpool. Um, we were discussing there the ICC beginning formal investigation into war crimes, possible war crimes that are taking place in the occupied Palestinian territories on the part of either the Israelis or even the Palestinians themselves. So this is not like it's just targeting the Israelis, it's, it's, it's a whole investigation about all possible war crimes that have taken place in those territories. Um, so this is, as Fetou Ben Souda, the ICC prosecutor, said, a neutral investigation. But why does it have the Israelis so worried? Why does it have the Americans so worried? Why did it have Donald Trump so worried that he sanctioned the ICC altogether? Of course, there's also, as I put to my guests, uh, the entire context of an Afghanistan war crimes investigation as well for the Americans. But putting that aside and just concentrating on the issue of Palestine, one wonders, uh, as Yossi there said, and our other guests alluded to as well, um, can it be that international law can only be applied to those who sign up to certain treaties? Shouldn't international law be above all of the above um, and be equal regardless of whether or not you sign on to it or agree to it. I mean, we need to have some um, across the board standards, do we not, for all countries to respect and follow? And if they don't, then there must be accountability. I mean, that seems like a fairly logical thing to say uh, at this time. I'll be back with my next segment after this break. Welcome back, viewers. You're still here on Scope with me, Wakar Rizvi. Now, in this segment, we're going to discuss Islamophobia, as we have quite a few times in my show. But we're going to hone in on Austria as a case study for a moment, because uh, racist sentiments against Muslims in Austria have, in fact, doubled. And this happened in the year 2020 uh, compared to the year 2019. Um, this is according to an Austrian human rights group itself, um, saying that 35 percent of the Austrian public has negative opinions about Muslims and 40 percent even support um, the idea that Muslims should not have equal um, rights um, as other Austrians, those who are non-Muslim Austrians altogether. Um, this as also uh, a Muslim Austrian academic, Farid Hafiz, who has been on this show before as well, um, he, he released his account of being interrogated at gunpoint that that incident had occurred, of course, back in November, but Farid just recently released details of what occurred in a, in a short film that was posted online. A harrowing detail, certainly, about he was, how he was held at gunpoint, um, and that is, that is, of course, brought out a lot of outrage as well about how Austria is dealing with its own Muslim citizens. Uh, let's discuss um, that a bit further. Now, John Francis Davis, who is a professor of religion and public policy at the University of Birmingham. He was previously advisor at, uh, at UK cabinet minister level on religion and community cohesion. He is joining us today from Birmingham in the UK. Uh, Francis, thank you very much for taking your time out to join us here in Scope today. Um, uh, what do you make of the direction that Austria is moving in? Um, it's certainly not a surprise in the sense that, you know, we do have a right wing uh, government in place. Nevertheless, um, to have this level of of suspicion towards your own fellow Muslim citizens on the part of the public is also worrying, is it not? I, I think it's it's worrying on a number of dimensions. I think what, one thing is it's it's a change in direction actually for the moderate part of the Austrian right, uh, and I think they're under pressure from the further right. They usually tend to do these more extreme things when they're in coalition with the Freedom Party or. Um, or, um, or under pressure from the right. So that's a concern because it might suggest a shift was right there and um, and, and one would hope that the Greens and the coalition would be seeking to moderate that. But then then I think what, what this does in other ways as well is it sure on the Austrian constitution. There have been attempts before to ban the burqa in under 10 year olds to, uh, to uh, regulate Muslim buildings. And several times that's been challenged in the constitution push back. But of course, if there's this popular uh, groundswell uh, in favor of discrimination against the Muslim community, increasingly that, that puts pressure on legislators to try and change aspects of the constitution. Uh, but it seems to me that this is worrying on a third dimension, which is that when you have a senior European Union state acting like this, then acting like this in collaboration with Monsieur Macron's uh, irresponsible behaviors in recent times, one starts to insert into the middle of the European project a whole series of languages 
about um, Muslims being suspicious, that's then at grave risk of polluting the whole European Union project, not just the dynamics of one of the local community. Yeah. I wonder, though, you know, Francis, once you have that sort of suspicion on the part of any public or nation, like the people themselves, it's really hard to dial that sort of thing back, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Although I would say that the uh, the tradition in European countries um, has, has been to kind of identify a minority of the moment. And so in that sense, if we came to Britain, we would uh, hear 19th century politicians condemning women with headdresses polluting the, uh, the children in the cities of Birmingham. And, and they, they don't mean in that case Muslim women, they're referring to Irish nuns arriving in Birmingham and set up schools and wearing their headdresses and the locals reacting to their Irish accents. And then later on, there was a similar reaction to Polish and a similar reaction to West Indians. So I think, I think what this does really is it points to a, a cultural weakness at the heart of Europe, which is that it's always looking for a group to blame and the current group that they want to signify, or that the European that Europe wants to signifies, um, are Muslims. And and when Muslims eventually win their rights, you know, my great fear would be that they'll move on to the next group, whether they come from North Africa, West Africa, South Africa, or parts of Asia. Okay, so then this othering uh, of people, right? If if I may use that term very loosely in this case, Francis, um, does, is this essentially a distraction on the part of politicians? Then, because I mean, this is not certainly limited to Austria, UK, or, or a whole host of other countries we can probably list. I mean, it seems like a, a tactic, um, especially at times of you know uh, economic unease, uh, etc. So there's a distinctive patterns with regards to the Muslim community, isn't there? Because we, we know, those of us that know the community, know that not all Muslims come from Bangladesh or from Pakistan or from Turkey. But very easily in some of these countries, uh, we can talk about Muslims only as Turks, Muslims only as radicals, Muslims only as Bangladeshi or only as Pakistani. And, and Islam is incredibly diverse. So that means that it gets bundled up with race as well. So I think one of the new things that's happening is there's a kind of a new racism. I think the categories get bundled up and then some politician see an opportunity in that to build their political base. And, and for some politicians, that's building a base in communities where there are no Muslim communities. So lots and lots of uh, communities in the UK that fear Islam have never had any Muslims live there. Hmm. Lots of communities in France where the fear of Islam is strongest, are the rural communities where there's very little diversities at all. But one kind of politician can build a base in, in communities where Muslims are absent. And then there's a different kind of politician that then picks up on the fear and, and tries to kind of stir that up inside the Muslim. Now, some people do that sensibly, talking about rights, talking about proper yeah. media presentation. But we have had examples, for example, uh, of candidates in the more radical end of the left, putting out leaflets in London, um, telling the aunties that they're about to have all of their halal food outlawed if the other candidate mm. from even the Labour Party is elected. And, and I think that, that that's bad as well. So, yeah. so it creates a new kind of thing of politics, which is not good for anybody. Indeed. Uh, we'll have to leave it there at that, Francis, as our, as our final comment. But we appreciate you taking your time out, uh, no doubt, of your busy schedule to share your thoughts with us this Friday. That was Francis Davis speaking to us there from Birmingham, um, sharing his expertise about you know what we're hearing coming out of Austria. Uh, a worrying pattern, certainly, about the increase in number of people, doubling, in fact, number of people who have negative opinions about Muslims. Um, even 40% of them, as I said, wanting to, to not have Muslims have the same rights as other Austrians in the country. And this is not limited to Austria. I mean, we've spoken about France a number of times, and there's probably um, a number of other places across Europe which we can also discuss, as Francis there alluded to in his answers as well, about how this is a trend right now. This Islamophobia is a trend right now, and Muslims are unfortunately, unfortunately, in the crosshairs at this point in time. We'll keep, of course, a very close eye on that, as well as Farid Hafiz's case as well um, uh, here in school. I'll be back with my final segment after this break.
Welcome back, viewers. You're still here on Scope with Muriel Carr, visiting the final segment of today's show. We're going to discuss David Miller, who is a professor at the University of Bristol. He's, in fact, been a guest on my show as well. Uh, 200 academics have, have defended, have signed an open letter defending uh, his academic freedom after he critiqued Zionism, uh, as well as, of course, Israeli activities specifically towards Palestinians in the occupied territories. Um, he's come under accusations of anti-Semitism um, by the Jewish Society of, which is which is a students club that is within the University of Bristol as well as of course a whole host of other people within the UK establishment as well uh, a lot of people are calling for him to be ousted from his current position at the University of Bristol but the university has not yet made any such decision um, he's spoken about Zionism uh, as encouraging Islamophobia anti-Arab racism etc um, and you know in 2017, in fact, there was an investigation carried out uh, which showed that Israel was, in fact, infiltrating a lot of these UK student movements by funneling them money um, to, uh, again, counter such critics such as uh, Professor Miller uh, at this time. Let's discuss this case as well as just the entire issue of um, critiquing Zionism and Israel altogether. We're now joined by Yusuf Al-Hilu, who is a political analyst and journalist. He's joining us today from London. Also joining us from the British capital is Dr. Haim Brashith, who is a professor at SOAS University of London. He's also the author of An Army Like No Other, How Israeli Defense Forces Made a Nation. Uh, Haim and Yusuf, thank you both for taking your time out to speak to us today here in Scope. Um, Haim, let me start with you, if I may. Um, what do you make of this case? Um, what do you make of the freedom to be able to criticize Zionism and Israel? Well, uh, as we know, there is no such freedom anymore, especially in the United Kingdom. Um, the UK government um, has accepted, um, not legally, but has accepted the IHRA definition that makes it um, anti-Semitic to um, criticize Israel in any way. Um, so um, that um, British society is now asked to follow. Uh, the um, Secretary of State for Education has written to all universities asking their VCs to um, accept the IHRA definition. Um, threatening them with cuts in funding uh, if they don't do so. Uh, so this is um, a civil um, battle now uh, in um, in the UK, and the government is play is taking the role uh, of a defense system for Israel and Israeli war crimes uh, because it is. Uh, starting to um, punish anyone who is criticizing mm. Israel in academia. Uh, the idea that, um, uh, you know, what was said uh, is um, justifying um, sacking a professor is bizarre. Uh, I am not um, enamored with the uh, language uh, that uh, that he used, but um, what he said was basically a critique of Israel, uh, uh, not not too harsh either. Uh, so I think that what we are now facing is a battle between most academics that would want to have the freedom to speak about any. Um, country in any state, yeah. um, and indeed, as a, as a, you know, both a UK and an Israeli citizen, I think it's my duty to criticize states which are involved in uh, war crimes. Hmm. Uh, you, what are your thoughts about this? Because you know. Um, this again, as as Heimler correctly said, this this goes to show that essentially that that room to to be able to criticize even within academia, where you know within academics here you would think that there would be complete freedom to discuss any ideas, however controversial, even um, that room and that that space seems to be closing very fast, isn't it? Well, this uh, anti-Semitism issue is like a scary crow. It's a policy of blackmailing pro-Palestine activists to keep silent. Um, as a matter of fact, in recent years, Israel has intensified its uh, a campaign of silencing those advocates pro-justice um, and also targeting the BDS activists as well, um, and allocated millions of uh, dollars um, at um, Tel Aviv, at embassies across the world to target those who um, speak highly of the Palestinian resistance or, or the Palestinian steadfastness or the Palestinian freedom. 
So um, it, it's not surprising anymore to hear about such stories that uh, speakers are being prevented to speak at the British um, universities. Uh, we know that um, the um, Jewish uh, Student Union lobby uh, is lobbying, um, you know, around the clock to uh, scare these activists and to um, give a message or, or a conflicting message that if you criticize Israel, then you are classified as anti-Semite. And this is the thing. It seems that people are not, um, you know, free to uh, express their opinion when it comes to criticize the actions of the Israeli government. Then how do you how do we then square uh, this this attempt to equate um, anti-Zionism or even just critique of Zionism and critique of Israel immediately with anti-Semitism? I mean, I would think at some levels that that hurts um, Israel itself in the sense that you know it keeps saying that listen we're the only democracy in the Middle East where you know we we have the most moral army in the world you know we've we've all heard those sort of statements before. This hurts that d democratic credit doesn't it? I think there are democratic credentials, uh, credentials at all for Israel to argue for. Uh, Israel has never been a democracy. It uh, is a, a Jewish state, and as such, it is based on um, racist um, apartheid. It's an apartheid state. It, two apartheid states were declared in 1948. One of them was Israel. The other one is gone. Uh, so I think um, the Israeli state is defending uh, a claim that has um, proved wrong a long time ago. Um, an apartheid state uh, cannot be democratic, and um, a state which is involved in oppressing five million people um, is not democratic and is actually illegal. Uh, the occupation is illegal. The way that Palestinians uh, are treated is illegal and immoral. So I think there are no um, credentials to defend, and we need to uh, act against um, Israeli apartheid like uh, the international community has uh, dealt with South African apartheid. This is the campaign, and this is the campaign of the academics in Britain, including Israeli academics in Britain, who have signed um, a public letter uh, against the IHRA definition. Hmm. Exactly, and, and on the on that definition, the IHRA definition, Yusuf, how, how troubling is that? Because you know, I know of even Jewish groups and, and you know Jews themselves who have criticized that definition of anti-Semitism altogether. Well, it seems um, um, Israel is doing its best to tarnish the image of those who uh, support uh, the, the the Palestinian justice. Um, the foreign ministry. Um, has uh, pushed uh, um, to the embassies uh, across the world to infiltrate uh, the British institutions, not only in Britain, but also across the world, to um, uh, fight those who speak highly of uh, the Palestinian uh, call for freedom and self-determination. Um, I mean, definitions are vary. Um, so basically, if you criticize Israel, then you straight to me automatically are classified anti as anti-Semite, unless you try to clarify yourself or to clarify your position. Um, and also, I think it's up to the Palestinians. Also, we need a definition for, uh, you know, to, for, for our uh, sake, uh, because obviously the Israelis, they um, send um, uh, false um, accusations or false information when it comes to the Palestinians. Um, so I remember one of the Israeli officials asked the Palestinians to forget about the Nakba, the catastrophe, um, because um, um, you know, Palestinians uh, have never given up. Uh, they continue to mark uh, such occasions year after year. Uh, so the speak, the, the loud speaking or the loud voices of the pro-Palestinian activists in the West is annoying to Israel because Israel thinks that Palestinians, um, you know, have gone quiet. So now we have to push uh, to pressure those uh, in the West also to keep silent. You know, Haim, one of the interesting dynamics when it comes to Israel and its relationship with a lot of uh, the more right-wing parties around the world. So, for example, if we're talking about um, right-wingers and, and more conservative elements in the U.S., for example, and I, I would imagine this is the same case in the U.K. as well, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of those right-wing elements, um, they are anti-Semitic. I mean, you know, even in the Capitol riot that occurred, um, uh, there was talk about how there was, you know, 
anti-Semitic um, tropes used during that riot, and that a lot of those people are known to be anti-Semites as well. I mean, that's an odd balancing act, if at all, right, that Israel is, is playing? It's not that odd when you think about it, because, um, you know, anti-Semitic parties and anti-Semitic movements and right-wing movements are supporting apartheid uh, because they are racist. So they are supporting Israel. Um, every single right wing uh, an, or extreme right movement is supporting Israel very, very uh, blatantly. Uh, so um, this uh, remember that most Zionists in the world are not even Jewish. Um, you know, there are more Zionist Christians in the United States than uh, all the uh, Zionist Jews put together, many more. Um, so basically, uh, those um, American uh, Christian Zionists are mostly anti-Semitic. They are waiting, uh, according to their religious uh, beliefs, for the end of uh, Israel and the end of um, the Jewish people, which will bring the second coming. So uh, Israel has no problem uh, supporting and being supported um, by uh, uh, extreme anti-Semites. Uh, the only people that are now blamed as being anti-Semitic are people who are anti-racist, like um, myself and many others who are acting against apartheid uh, and against um, the Israeli occupation and its iniquities. Uh, they don't have a problem with anti-Semitism, with real anti-Semitism. They have only a problem with people who criticize Israel and um, are trying to argue for the full Palestinian rights and the Palestinian return. Hmm. Yusuf, I'll give you the final word then. So uh, as Heimler said uh, correctly, um, this actually hurts the cause of fighting racism and anti-Semitism, doesn't it? Because um, true anti-Semitism then gets ignored in this case. Uh, you know, hypocrisy, it packs, it packs fire. Because if you continue arguing that um, anti-Semite uh, definition is that uh, as long as you criticize Israel, then you are anti-Semite. This, uh, this is a, a way to prevent people from expressing themselves. And of course, it uh, uh, denies people's uh, you know, voices. Uh, but also not forget, let's also not forget, if uh, Haim shares the same point of view, is that we also Arabs are Semite, so we cannot be anti-us. Well, we'll leave there at that. Um, unfortunately, the clock has gotten the best of us, but we sincerely appreciate both Yusuf and Haim to take, for taking out their time for us today and for sharing their insight with us. We were discussing there the case of David Miller, but we're just using that really as a case study to discuss overall how any critique of Zionism slash Israel is, is now very quickly labeled anti-Semitism. And there's, there's a fine line there which needs to exist because if Israel claims that it is um, a democracy which is which is flourishing with its democratic credentials in place, has the more, most moral army in the world, we've all heard those sort of statements, then let people critique you then. I mean, that is part of democracy after all, isn't it? Um, the IHRA definition, the fact that one would go after a professor for critiquing Zionism and Israel for its policies, whether or not you agree with those critiques or not is not, a, is not the question, but he has the freedom, especially as a professor, especially within academia, to raise issues which you may find controversial. Um, he's not propagating hatred towards any specific religious group? Um, or is that now the understanding that any single criticism of Israel, any single criticism of Zionism must always be equated with, with hatred for Jews? I mean, that seems like quite a far stretch because then, and if the roles were reversed when it comes to Muslim countries, then that would be something which would be really hard for the rest of the world to digest. Why would it be then that every single criticism of every single Muslim country would be seen as Islamophobia? That again is illogical altogether. I'll leave it there for now. I've been Wakar Rizvi. Thanks for watching.